Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our five minute histories videos and today we're going to talk about the SS John W. Brown and I'd like to start with a quick thanks to all of the volunteers at Project Liberty Ship, the group that takes care of this, uh, this ship here and especially to Mike Schneider, our host today who has let me on board. And I think of all of the times that we have done videos, this is the first that I am not on terra firma. I'm here on the deck of the ship, um, we're docked uh, at the port of Baltimore, but we are surely floating in the Chesapeake Bay, so it's kind of fun to do something new. All right, before turning to the ship itself, I'd like to say a few words about Liberty ships. These were the workhorses of World War II. During the war, they shipped anything from backpacks and rations um, to tanks and even troops. Um, they carried pretty much everything. Um, the government for the Merchant Marine, the U.S. government for the Merchant Marine, made 2,700 of them um, during the war years. If you do the math, that turns out to be producing two ships every three days. Pretty extraordinary. And the ships themselves were actually kind of plain. That's what they were known for at the time. They were made to be uh, relatively inexpensive to build. Um, and to be able to build pretty quickly. They're about 400 feet long. Um, they can carry up to 10,000 tons of cargo. Um, and they were meant, to, they were designed to last about five years. Um, so really they were designed to win the war uh, but not be permanent features on the high seas. Um, if you're wondering where the term Liberty Ship came from, um, it came from uh, when they were first, uh, uh, first launched. Um, they were not uh, relished as beauties when they went into the water. In fact, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, uh, when he saw his first one, um, he said, and let me quote, he said uh, that it was um, a dreadful looking thing. That's what he called them. Um, the Time Magazine called them ugly ducklings, um, but they really became uh, a symbol of what the U.S. could do when we put our mind to it. Um, but they got their name when they were first launched. Uh, President Roosevelt um, gave a speech and uh, he referenced Patrick Henry. The first ship was that went into the water, the first of the hatchlings, if we can use the ugly duck analogy. The first of the hatchlings that went in was the Pat, SS Patrick Henry. Um, and uh, Roosevelt quoted his famous line about give me liberty or give me death, and then said that these ships would bring liberty to Europe. And in many ways they did. Um, so that's how they got their name. Um, over the war years, they, they were transport ships, but uh, at least one of them was able with its small amount of guns to sink a German war boat. Um, and they, uh, and they did very well. After the war, there were 2,400, so 24 of the 2,700 were here, um, were left, uh, a number didn't make it. Um, and uh, the US Navy repurchased a number of them, um, but Greek entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs from Greek, uh, Greece, purchased uh, upwards of 500 of them. Italian shipping entrepreneurs purchased almost 100 of them um, and turned them into fleets. Some of those folks uh, got fabulously wealthy. And although we may not recognize the names of most, we're, we will recognize the name of at least one. Um, and his name, this young man who purchased a number of Liberty ships, was Aristotle Onassis. And he, of course, went on to become the second husband of Jacqueline Kennedy after President Kennedy was shot. He got his uh, fortune uh, as a shipping magnet with former Liberty ships. So after the war, some became uh, transport vessels in private use. A few went on to become uh, schools, uh, and that we'll use that to turn to the SS John Brown. Um, the SS John Brown was made here at the Bethlehem uh, Fairfield shipyards. Um, like all Liberty ships, it was made in pieces and then welded together. Um, a lot of that welding was done by women. So uh, think Rosie the Riveter, uh, but this, these Rosies had uh, welding torches in their hands. Um, so it was launched in 1942. Um, John Brown uh, is not the John Brown of Harper's Ferry fame. John W. Brown was uh, a man born in Canada, came down to Maine, and uh, became a union organizer for miners and carpenters, and then eventually shipbuilders. And the deal was, in World War II, if you raised enough money or were part of a group that raised enough money, you could name a ship. And so what better name uh, for a ship here, a Liberty ship, than after a man who fought for the rights of shipbuilders themselves. So it was launched in 
in 1942. It took 54 days to build. Um, that was a, it was one of the earlier ships, I think ship number 64 out of five, 380 some uh, out of Fairfield. It cost $1.75 million and it took 500,000 man hours to build, or actually probably man hours and woman hours. Um, and it too was just about 400 feet long. But its first cargo um, included, let me read this, included two Custis P-40 Warhawk fighters, uh, airplanes, 40 Sherman tanks, 200 motorcycles, 100 Jeeps, 700 tons of ammunition, and 250 tons of canned pork lunch meat. All of this was headed to the Soviet Union via the Persian Gulf for the war effort there in the early years of the war. So after the war, this ship became a, um, a uh, sailed up to the Hudson. I think it did eight voyages total and then sailed up the Hudson and became part of the New York public school system, the SS John W. Brown High School, training uh, young boys, young men to become merchant Marines. Um, and it did really well there for things like Marine radio and Marine um, electronics, even uh, Marine business. Maybe they took a page or two from the Greek and Italian entrepreneurs. But in 1982, budget cuts forced its closure. Um, by then, uh, or just shortly after then, a group called the Project Liberty Ship formed of volunteers to help care for this uh, ship. Um, and it sailed down to Norfolk, Virginia, where it was cared for for a number of years until 1988, when it sailed up here to Baltimore. And we are here in the port of Baltimore uh, on the water. And it's been here ever, ever since. In 1991, it got uh, totally refurbished and is now one of only two Liberty ships that's fully functional. Um, in a really poignant way, it did in 1991, it went back out to the Chesapeake Bay and passed its sea trials, just as it did when it was launched from the Bethlehem Fairfield Yards um, in 1942. So very neat there. And I'm going to end by saying, uh, COVID or not, this is a working vessel, a uh, museum that, uh, that goes out under the water. Um, and uh, at age 79, it is not doing too bad for a ship that was made to last five years. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.